And welcome, Hoosier fans, to this week's edition of Banner Monday, where we kick off each week by doing what IU fans love more than anything else, talking hoops. IU hoops, Big Ten hoops, deep dives into basketball strategy and concepts, plus previews of IU's upcoming opponent. We do it all here every Monday, and we are happy to have you here with us. I'm your host, Jared Morris. This is the eighth edition of Banner Monday, and it is our 454th episode overall of the Assembly Call, recorded on the afternoon of Monday, December 10th, 2018. And we dedicate this episode to Eric Anderson, who played for Indiana from 1988 to 1992. He had a terrific career, winning two Big Ten championships and helping lead the Hoosiers to the 1992 Final Four. We all found out this morning that he passed away at just 48 years old. Uh, we'll have more on this. I'm going to talk some more about this in Banner Monday tomorrow. Just a shocking and uh, and, and, and the tragic story, obviously. Um, but rest in peace, Biggie. This episode dedicated to you. And like I said, we'll have more uh, on his uh, great IU career uh, coming up tomorrow in Banner Monday, or Banner Morning. All right, well, let's begin this edition of the Assembly Call how we begin every edition of the Assembly Call, and that is with our Hoosier Proud Banner Moment. And today's Banner Moment is a compilation of moments from one of IU's mature beyond his years freshmen. And while it would be easy to start listing out all the many incredible offensive plays that were delivered this week by Romeo Langford, and my goodness, there were a lot of them, we're all well aware that Romeo is only going to be in the candy stripes for one season. So while we should cherish his fantastic contributions while we have him, and he can certainly still get much better over the course of this season, there isn't much of a point daydreaming about what his play today could mean for the kind of college player he might be a year or two years or even three years from now. But there is a point in doing it for Rob Finnessy. And sweet mercy, did he make some plays this week that get you excited about not just what he's capable of right now, but just how good he can become after you know having a few years of experience under his belt. You know, you think back, the scooping layup to end the first half against Penn State, the remarkable defensive play to ice that game and give Indiana its first road win, the three to give Indiana its first lead against Louisville, then another three to put the Hoosiers up for good at 60 to 58. And there were many, many more other big shots, good passes, big rebounds, smart defensive plays. Rob's numbers weren't overwhelming during these two games, but the impact of the plays that he made absolutely was. And Rob isn't the best player on this IU team. He isn't the most valuable player, but he's absolutely become a guy that Indiana counts on to come up big in clutch moments. And that's a role he seems likely to have for as long as he's a Hoosier. All right, to my right, he is a columnist for the big lead. He's a co-host of The Hangover, and he's someone who is always working to perfect his Chuck Crab impression. He's a sophomore. He is Ryan Phillips. Ryan, welcome back to Banner Monday. Thanks, man. Uh, I think it's worth noting Indiana cracked the top 25 in the AP poll today, yep. tied with Syracuse and Kansas State. Uh, first time <laughs> in Archie Miller's tenure that Indiana has been ranked in the top 25. Big. I mean, obviously, it's a small step, but pretty Thank nice. Thank you. To be rewarded for that. Uh, I also would like to mention it is the seventh anniversary of the watch shot today, uh, which was our first season of doing the show. Jared, I, do I, I need a sound drop for that. I, I really, I, I need to have something for that shot. I don't have anything. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know, man. It just, you should just have Watford for the win because everybody knows after that you don't have to play the whole thing, but just Watford for the win. Uh, or, or, or this deep cut that our longtime listeners will get some girl in Chicago or something. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. The, the reason yeah. why I was doing the show by myself. Uh -huh. Yeah, no. She knows who she is. Um <laughs> but I haven't spoken to her in years for some reason. Uh she's very happy in her life. It's yeah, got rid of me and everything worked out. Um, but yeah, I I think it's, it's amazing that seven years have passed and that was our first season doing the show. And uh it was a really great way to sort of like revive Indiana basketball and it really helped boost us too, I think, because people just had so much hunger for IU basketball after that that it really propelled our show people were seeking out new avenues and new places to listen and, and discuss IU basketball I think that really helped us so uh, really an awesome memory and it, it is funny because even I, I remember months and months later uh, you know I was at Knicks and they had that on ESPN Classic, that game, just randomly on ESPN Classic in the middle of an afternoon, crowded lunch spot at Knicks. And when it came down to the last play, the entire place went silent. They showed the play and everybody in the place just cheered like crazy. And it was eight months after it happened. You know, it wasn't like this was the week of or anything. This was months later and it was randomly on That's in awesome. an afternoon on ESPN Classic and everybody in the bar went nuts when it happened again. People were slapping high fives. I mean, season was over 
and they were just slapping high fives. It was it was great. So that's pretty uh, much Bloomington. That's one of my favorite uh, uh, IU basketball memories. Isn't just the watch shot. It's the months afterwards, people celebrating it. So absolutely. All right. So here's what's on tap for today. Ryan and I are going to answer your questions. We got several good ones. Then we will take a look at IU and around the Big Ten with Mike DeCourcy. We will have another edition of Basketball 201 with Ben Ladner looking at IU's offense. And then we will have an IU Butler preview. And so, Ryan, let's just jump right in and start answering some questions here. Uh, JD sent this one in, uh, and all these questions were submitted uh, in- inside of our private uh, IU basketball community, which if you're interested in joining us, you can go to assemblycall.com slash community and check that out. But JD says, IU has won several close games this year, a sign of leadership that suggests bigger things are coming or a sign of some kind of kind of luck data noise that will even out with some later season uh, uh, frustrating close losses. So here's what's interesting about this is uh, Jordan Sperber, um, oh, what is his Twitter account? I retweeted a lot because his new podcast is really good. Um, but he, he tweeted out a really interesting graphic that showed coaches' records in close games. And Archie is one of 14 coaches in the country, one of only 14, with a winning percentage above 60% in games decided by five points or less with a minimum of 50 games. So he's had a lot of experience in these situations, and his teams have generally played pretty well. It's interesting because he's right next to Kelvin Sampson uh, on that graph. Who you know? Who who's that? Yeah, well, you know, we've never questioned his coaching aptitude. Just some of the other stuff. I don't even but, know who you're talking about. You know, but but the other guys that are on that list: Brad Stevens, Mark Few, Bill Self, Jim Beheim, Steve Fisher. Some really successful coaches. And the reason I bring that up is to say, you know, we are seeing Indiana do much better in in close games because Indiana did not have a winning record in close games under Tom Crean. And I think Archie has a long enough track record now that it's probably reasonable to say that he's just a good coach in close games and his teams tend to do well in close games. You look back at his time in Dayton and hat tip to Jay Horry, who put who put these numbers together inside of the community. But he was 45 and 35 in close games at Dayton, games decided by five points or fewer. And that includes going eight and 18 in his first two years. Those are his first two years as a head coach. So Archie is a coach who has done very well in close games. Now, obviously, anytime you have close games, you know, a bounce here, a bounce there could change things. But over time, it seems like he's a coach whose teams perform very well. It's probably in part a trend, less than, yeah. you know. Just yeah, and, and and you would think, you know, what what contributes to that? You know, obviously being able to play strong defense, get stops when you need them. Obviously, you have to be a coach whose teams are calm and are well coached to be able to execute. And, you know, you've also got to recruit good players who play well and kind of have that that mentality and that mental toughness. You know, guys you've got to have on offense, you've got to have go to sets that you know will work yeah. on defense, as you said. Solid defense. I mean, and even you can play good defense and teams can beat you. They can hit threes, covered, whatever. We saw saw it happen to Gonzaga this weekend. They lost to Tennessee on, you know, if a guy makes that shot, that three pointer that the that Tennessee made, you're gonna lose. Uh, that happens. But over time, you're not going to have that happen every game. That's going to happen occasionally. Over time, you see the trend play out. The trend playing out for Archie Miller is he wins close games. Uh, to Back to the question, though, the question was, is this something that will concern us later in the year? No, I think playing in close games is a good experience because you're used to playing it. I, I think that all year, one of the questions, if we're going just looking at football with Alabama, was how are they going to handle a close game? They, they played in blowouts all year. They blew everybody out because they were really good. If they got challenged, how would they respond? We learned that when they played in the SEC championship game against Georgia, they responded. That works in basketball, too. You don't know how teams are going to play until they get challenged. You know, it's easy to blow teams out. It's easy to, have, to, to play well when everything's going right. What happens when things get screwed up and you have an off game? And it's good preparation for the tournament because guess what? Nothing goes as planned in the NCAA tournament unless you're Villanova last year and you just blow everybody out. It's And that was such a historic run and it never happens. In, in, in a tournament setting, you're going to face teams you're not super prepared for. You're going to face teams that... Uh, you know, go on runs and all that. How do you handle adversity? How do you move forward in a game like that and playing in close games and dealing with as I, you did trailing by a bunch in the second half, they are able to turn it around and make something happen. So I think that playing in close games is a huge benefit to the team. Obviously you want to blow everybody out and not have an ulcer every game as I, I think we're all starting to develop with this team, but at the same time, Experience in close games later in the season pays dividends. Yeah, you want to be beating Northwestern and Penn State by more than two points, but the fact that they were able to handle those games and win them does say something about the team's toughness. 
By the way, Jordan Sperber's Twitter account, HoopVision68, he's got a new podcast. It's about 14 episodes in. It's not necessarily something I thought was that I was going to listen to every episode. I've gotten a lot out of each one. Highly recommend it. It's, it's one of those that will really make you a smarter Hoops fan. Even if you look at the descriptions and are like, this doesn't sound that interesting, just listen to it. Trust me, they have really, really interesting college Hoops conversations. Um, okay, this question comes from Scott, Ryan. Does our strategy of attacking the basket contribute to our games being so tight? We are being really efficient on our twos, but every game is close. Louisville beat us by 21 from three. We got them by 16 from two and six from the free throw line. We can't produce more three-point threats magically, and maybe this is just prisoner of the moment talking, but with our turnover and free throw issues, will this create problems against top-level teams? I don't think so. I think that uh, you have to do what your team does well, and this team attacks the paint, scores in the paint, and scores twos better than it does threes. You can't force your team into trying to shoot that, that happened one year with, with Tom Crean's team. I think it was maybe the year after, I don't remember which year it was, it might've been 15, no 14 where they just, they tried to shoot threes and they were, had a bunch of bad three point shooters and they lost yeah, 2014. a lot of it was we were terrible. Okay. And, and you know, you can't do that. You can't put a square peg in a round hole. And, and so you have to work with what you have. Now you have to be versatile so that when you get, players who can shoot threes, your system can shift to focus on that more. But right now, this team does not have a bunch of dead-eye three-point shooters. It has a few guys who can hit them, and it has a few guys who maybe later in the season will be better at this. I think Rob Finnessy is a guy whose shot looks good. He rushes it a little bit, and he saw a couple times this week against uh, Louisville where he just rushed three-pointers that were off. But in general, his shot looks much better than it did in high school. Romeo can hit threes, but he's not a knockdown three-point shooter. He can hit them though. Uh, Jawan Morgan can hit a three every once in a while, but that's not what he. That's not his the center of his game. Uh, yep. I think that as the recruiting process continues and Archie Miller starts getting more versatile and balanced guys in here, maybe the offense will spread out a little bit. But right now, this is a team that does something very well. What it does, it attacks the basket and 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 scores in the paint. That's what they need to continue to do. And if you do that really well, all you have to do is defend the three-point line. It's, I mean, and and this team can play defense. Keep those percentages low. It doesn't matter how many, uh, how many three-pointers, you know, how many points from the three-point line the other time the team beats you by. If they don't beat you in twos and you're outpacing them big time in twos, it'll even out. Uh, and also the the big thing with this team that they've struggled with a little bit is getting long rebounds. And when, when you force other teams to shoot threes, you've got to secure the long rebounds and not give them second chance opportunities. That's the next step for this team defensively is it's pressuring the three-point line. They're playing good defense, but they need to secure those long rebounds because that's giving teams extra chances to beat them. And if you're forcing teams to shoot threes, the percentage is going to go. They're, they're not going to shoot a great percentage. They never are. If they shoot above 45, 50%, you're going to lose the game. That's just the way basketball is. But if you stop those second chance opportunities, you give yourself a better chance to win. So I think that's the key there is not how much the other team outscores you by, but you force them to take contested shots and then you get the rebounds. You'll be fine no matter what you do on the offensive end. This team has a lot of guys who are pretty good shooters. N not off the dribble, right? Like off a pass, they can knock down, uh, you know, a shot if they're open. But, you know, you look at guys like Juwan, Rob Finnessy, Al Durham, Evan Fitzner. They're not going to create a lot of their own three-pointers. Unless but they it's can a make them jab, step, step back. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, and, and even that. And so, you know, in an ideal world, I think Indiana would have a little bit more flexibility and be able to shoot more threes. But more you're balance. right. Yes, for this year's team, it's fine. You know, and, and just to put some numbers behind this, Indiana 326th in the percentage of their field goals that are three-point attempts and 324th in the percentage of points that come from the three-point line. So, no, we're not getting a lot from three-point range, but we're 108th in the country, 35.9% shooting threes. So we're not taking a lot, but we're being pretty efficient with the ones that we're taking. And given the fact that we are elite and will continue to be elite scoring around the basket, I think that's a fine balance. I think it's exactly what Indiana should do for this year with an to eye toward with, with an eye toward being a little bit more balanced in the future. Yeah. And they have to be a threat from out there. There's no Which doubt. Which we are. It. Yeah. And, and we are. are. Yeah, yeah. And, and so you have to have guys who can hit it from out there. And I think that's the whole point of bringing Evan Fitzner in is stretching the floor. And, 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 you know, obviously there are other guys as well. Al Durham's worked on his shot. As you said, Rob Finnessy, Romeo can hit a shot from out there, but you've got to be a threat from out there. 
but you don't have to live out there. And and you look at, especially when you look at guys like Romeo, who's super efficient going to the hoop. You look at Juwan, who dominates. When it, if he gets it one-on-one in the post, he's scoring, unless yep. unless it's just a fluke. And then Deron Davis as well is emerging as a post threat again as he gets healthier. So those three guys alone, Justin Smith, he's going to score at the, hoop, at the rim when he does get it. And we saw it this weekend. He, he scores attacking the hoop on back cuts and things like that. When you have those guys, you're fine. It's it's a matter of just maintaining a threat from the outside so that those driving lanes are opened up. Um, once the other teams start collapsing on those driving lanes and mucking everything up, that's when it becomes a problem. So as long as they're a threat from out there and you have to respect them from out there, things are okay. Yep. Okay, next question from Jim. Ryan mentioned Saturday how Duran's face-to-face with Malik Williams was a good demonstration of leadership, and I think most IU fans would agree that Juwan is the de facto team leader while Zach leads more by example. Then we have a freshman playing point guard, a position often considered the floor leader. What are the implications of having different kinds of leaders on the team? I think Just, it's it's super important uh, because you need to have guys who are good in the locker. Room. You need to have guys who are good on the floor at, you know, just sort of getting everyone together. You need to have emotional, you know, talking leaders. I mean, Juwan, you've seen it sometimes this year where he'll get a dunk and get fouled and kind of flex and scream or whatever. You need a guy like that to provide energy. Um, when you see a guy like Romeo, who's very calm all the time and kind of subdued and, you know, just I, I think it's a focus thing with him, but he doesn't really – get too fired up, too high, too low. No, but he's all, but he also leads with his talent. You exactly. know, like he, no, no, no. he can put I, people at ease. I was, I was there. I, I was going there and I'm saying that he doesn't need to do that. He provides enough yeah. for this team. Um, so you need different guys. You need a guy like Deron Davis, who's your biggest guy in more ways than one to just sort of, you know, let a guy know you can't hammer our freshmen and, and maybe go face to face with them. Having multiple types of leaders is really important. And you need leadership from the coaching staff as well. You need them to be able to command the locker room and be able to command the huddle. And so I think we've And, seen- and you need leadership from your bench. Yeah. You know, maybe a guy who's not playing well, but who, you know, maybe an older guy who doesn't get as many minutes like an Evan Fitzner who only plays two minutes against Louisville. He's got to lead by example in kind of being okay with that and putting the team first to Zach set an McRoberts example for guys like Demisey and Clifton. Yeah, and and Zach McRoberts from the bench as well. I would say a guy, an energy guy on the bench too. Like uh, uh, you've seen Jake Forrester yelling a lot from the bench and talking and getting fired up. Though every level of that, even the walk-ons, you know, when a guy gets a dunk to bounce off and start screaming and stuff, that's all important. And and it all works to help energize and build the chemistry of the team. But I do think, yeah, you need vocal leaders. You need leaders by example. You need guys who are kind of do the unspoken things like Duran did, where he kind of got in somebody's face after. His, his prized freshman got fouled. I mean, there's, you know, there's all kinds of different levels and having those different things is very important. If you're going to be a, a team that's going to compete long-term, it helps chemistry. It helps development of guys because they feel bought into the program. So they're going to try harder because they feel connected to the other guys. We've had teams in the past where there was a void of complete void of leadership. And you know how frustrating that is. It's not about, as the question says, it's not about one type of leadership or one guy doing it all because one guy can't do it all. It's it's about having multiple levels of leadership. And it typically your veterans provide that. But I think a guy like Rob Finnessy, I wouldn't call him a leader yet, but the fact that he's calm on the ball and he's he's not yet, he's not there yet, but I'm saying the fact that he's calm on the ball, the fact that he you know d- it has been big late in games and things like that, that's a form of leadership as well yeah. because it just, settles everybody else down and especially when he has the ball in his hands and Romeo again knowing his talent knowing what he can do when he gets the ball in his hand that's a form of leadership because again the rest of the team can kind of be like all right let's let Romeo do his thing you know and and mm-hmm. that just it kind of settles everything and it helps with team chemistry it helps with faith in each other and things like that all those nebulous things coaches talk about are very important for the length of a season. I think more than any other sport, chemistry is so important in basketball, Uh, just being connected offensively and defensively, and also having those leaders, having that connection gets guys to talk on the floor more, and that we know how important that is for, for defense especially. And leadership is fluid, you know, it can yeah. ebb and flow and leaders can, leaders can emerge over a season too. So, well, and when, a, when a leader is struggling, other guys need to step up, you know, I mean, there's, there's a yeah. whole, it's, it's a whole chemistry and it's, it's almost like an ecosystem. One part fails, the other parts have to kind of step up and, and provide for it. Yep. All right. Last question. And this kind of goes back to the one about shooting and we actually got a few of these. Uh, so we'll just take bills as a composite. 
Are we recruiting any shooters? I understand needing length and athleticism, and I'm pleased with how Archie's doing, but we need one or two guys that can just flat out shoot. We are not a threat from three. So the first thing is I would question the premise of us not being a threat from three. And and we already talked about that, how Indiana actually has a very smart strategy for their three-point shooting this year and have so far been pretty efficient with it. And we've mentioned before, Ryan, you know, when it comes to recruiting shooters, you know, this class of 2019 was always going to be a little bit odd because Trace and Keon aren't necessarily known as shooters, but they're great basketball players. And you were going to take them if you had a chance to get them, no matter what. Trace is already in the fold. Keon, we're waiting to see. I will say one thing. Armand Franklin is not a guy who's known as a shooter. And it was, you know, it felt like it came down between he and Brandon Newman. And Newman was the guy known more as a shooter. Well, Armand Franklin just made five threes over the weekend. And and his shooting has apparently gotten a lot better. So, look, I think that you will see, you know, you look in the class of 2020, Indiana is targeting some more guys who are kind of known as shooters. But, you know, you also, like, like take Jordan Holes for an example, right? Like, Jordan Holes was a terrific player, okay? Is he the type of player that Archie Miller would recruit for his system? You know, you would think that Jordan Holes would have a spot at Indiana no matter what, no matter when, Mr. Basketball, he probably would. But, you know, a guy like Anthony Leal will be an interesting test case because he is known as a shooter at Bloomington South, but Indiana hasn't offered yet because I think Archie's trying to figure out, is this a guy who defends at the level that we want? You know, does he have the length and some of the other things that we want? So we do need shooting. I think it will be a priority, but you're also you also have to balance it with other things. You you can't just take a guy because he can shoot. He's got to be able to do some other things, too. And Indiana is going to be recruiting at a level where you can try and get more of the full package. Well, you see fans who've had frustrations with Evan Fitzner this year, and that's why you can't take a guy who just shoots and expect him to, you know, expect him to be a big impact. Like Evan Fitzner, I think, can do other things on the floor. But right now he's kind of struggling. But all he's really provided is shooting so far and, you know, some length. But that's why you can't take a guy just because he's a shooter. You have to take basketball players and well-rounded basketball players. And that's what Archie's going to do. Now, on to Keon Brooks and these guys. I think Arma Franklin is shooting much better this year. Remember last year, everyone said, Rob Finnessy can't shoot threes. Like, that's his big thing. Well, he worked on it and he got better. And, Makes it when they count, that's for and, sure. And I actually thought that during his senior year, his shot looked a lot better. And I mentioned that on the show several times. I thought his shot was looking better. Wasn't where it needed to be, but it was getting there. And it looks better now. It's a progressive thing. I mean, Yogi got better as he went along. It became a dead-eye three-point shooter by the time he was a senior. It's it's about development and working on your craft. Armand Franklin looks better this year. Uh, that's not his go-to game, of course, but it hasn't had to be his go-to game. He's been athletic enough just to score points driving and, and getting to the rim. I like that they took Armand Franklin. I think he's a bit of a bulldog of a player. I love his attitude. I love his personality. I love the fact that he can play defense. Trace Jackson Davis isn't going to be a shooter. He's a guy who needs to develop as an outside shooter for the next level. But at IU, that's not what he's going to be doing. And hopefully, you know, he'll develop that as he moves on because he wants to be a high level, uh, you know, next level guy. Keon Brooks can shoot a little bit. Um, Improving. Not, that That's not his go to. Again, no. not his go to game, but he can shoot threes. And what you need are the best way to do it is to have balanced guys who can shoot, who can drive, who can get in the play. That's your goal. That's what you want. And it could be that Archie feels like you can develop shooting as opposed to developing the ability to get to the hoop, the ability to be athletic, the ability to to be six know, eight and defend, <laughs> yeah, have long arms, <laughs> whatever. Um, I think a guy like Reese Thompson will be able to shoot too. I mean, when we, you know, who knows when we're going to see him, and we all hope he gets better. Uh, obviously, struggling with a concussion right now, and they need to take all the time he needs to get back. But I think a guy like Reese Thompson, you know, watching his high school film and then watching what we saw earlier in the year, the way he moves out on the perimeter. I think he's a guy who can step out and knock down some shots. I think Juwan Morgan can knock down shots more than he has this year. He just hasn't had to. He's been in the post a lot and been so successful. Why would you move him out? So, yes, I mean, obviously you want to recruit balanced guys. You want to recruit guys who can knock down shots. But it's not always going to be perfect. It's not always going to be one for one. And you're not always going to get the targets you're aiming for, especially at an Indiana level. When you're in Indiana and you're recruiting guys, you're recruiting the same guys that Kansas, that Kentucky, that Duke, that North Carolina, that wherever else uh, are are recruiting as well. And you're not going to get everyone. That's just not the way it works. If you lose out to a Duke or a Kansas, you kind of say, well, you know what? They went to a good basketball school. You can't really be upset. It's about fit and it's about relationship. Two of the better shooters that we targeted, Darius Garland, DJ Carton, you know, you went up against, you know, Vanderbilt and Ohio State for those guys and you didn't get them. Garland and, and, because he's from you know that area and you know Carton, Carton because he wanted to go I mean, to Ohio State. Yeah, and and again you kind of you know you're gonna, you're not going to get everybody. You, no yeah. matter how hard you recruit them, you can do absolutely nothing wrong in a recruitment and lose a guy when you're recruiting at this level against the top 
teams in the country. A lot of times it's fit. A lot of times it's what they feel on campus. A lot of times it's with the system. What are they going to do? Uh, are they going to have as many defensive assignments? Can they just go out and play? Can they play wide open? I mean, there's a reason guys go to Kentucky. It's because they focus so much on offense. These guys can all score and you know get their points and improve their stock. And then nobody expects them to be around for a sophomore season. I mean, it's it's obvious why they go places like that. So um, I would say that sometimes you're just not going to get the guys you want. So saying we're not recruiting shooters, that's not necessarily true. We're recruiting shooters. We just may not be getting the knockdown guys that we want to get. So you have to kind of move on to plan two. Right now, I think this recruiting class is shaping up to be fantastic. Um, It may not be perfect as far as being well-rounded and having, as you said, shooters and everything you want but it's shaping up to be fantastic and they're going to make it work. I think, by the way, we should mention Demizi, whose main skill is shooting. And that's why he was given a scholarship to Indiana. It's because he's a really good shooter. So. No, I, I agree. And I, but you know, he's a guy that we're not seeing on the floor much. And I think that's the right decision. He's not ready yet. I, I right. said at the beginning of the year, after watching him in high school, I thought, you know what? I, I think that's a guy who needs to red shirt. And I think he was thrust into action before they really wanted to put him in there because of injuries. Yep. All right, Ryan, any final thoughts before we head on out here? Oh, it's kind of nice to have a week off for these guys to sort of relax and rest. It's been a hectic season so far, really. I mean, especially with the road trip to uh, road trips to Raleigh and Arkansas and, uh, you know, be nice for these guys to kind of get some and of course, uh, State College be nice for these guys to get a week off to kind of just relax. Yep. All righty, coming up on the Assembly Call, it is time for our Big Ten Roundup with Mike DeCourcy from BTN and the Sporting News. We will talk about Indiana's two victories and discuss another solid week of non-conference action for the conference. Stick with us here on the Assembly Call. All right. Thanks, as always, for being here, Ryan. Yeah, of course. You going to be there Thursday night? Yeah. Um... For those wondering about Leal, I think he eventually gets an offer. I just think that they're taking their time with him. He's they're definitely he's, taking the time. I mean, you also have to – it's also going to be a small class. And yeah. We've got a lot of irons in the fire with guys rated a lot higher than him, so it'll be interesting to see. But, yeah, I think I think he'll eventually get a shot if he wants it. Plus, you, you never know. Guys are going to go pro, whatever. I think that class will open up a little. I agree. All right, I'll I let agree. you boys do your, do your job. Hi, Mike. Have you, hey. Hi, Ryan. How you doing? Great. <clears throat> I figured you guys had probably met before. But we haven't, actually. No, you haven't? No, I'm just a big fan. Oh, well, here we go. (laughs) Have a great day, guys. (laughs) All right, thanks, Ryan. All right, how you doing, Mike? I'm good, how are you? I'm doing well, doing well. Hoosiers are back in the top 25 for the first time in the uh, Archie Miller era, so feeling good. (laughs) All right, are we... uh... Let me get this set up. Do you you have those headphones by chance? Oh, uh, they're right here, hold on. Um, okay. Man, I saw someone. That's uh, Joel. I saw what you said about Race Thompson maybe missing the whole year. That would be not good. Not good. Hopefully that does not prove true. Not that I don't trust your information, but hopefully he can get back at some point. Okay. All right. You ready to roll into this? I'm ready to go. Okay. Here we. Oh, wait a second. Will you talk again? Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. Or, am I not good? I don't know if I don't know if it's picking up your headphones. Um, in Zoom, if you go, there's a little if you look in the Zoom window, there's a little microphone and it says mute down in the bottom left hand corner. There's a little arrow. Yeah. And if you click on that arrow, it should allow you to pick your microphone. You're probably on like built in microphone. And it I don't know what the what exactly the optionals say, but it, there should be maybe a headphone option or external option. Okay, it says switch to phone audio. Oh, that's um, right. You're on your phone. No, I'm on my computer here. Oh, you are. Okay. Um, it says microphone array, same as system, select a speaker. Um, that's the headphone, I guess. It's test speaker and microphone, maybe. Yes, hmm. you hear that. Usually, usually it picks it up right when you put them in. Okay. Uh, well, wait, wait. Let me try that again. Can you? You still can't hear me. I can hear you. It just it sounds the same. Okay. Um, as before you plugged in the headphones. Huh. Well, it worked so well last time. I wonder why. Yeah, it did. I don't know. Let me try this one more time. What if I say switch to phone audio? What does that do? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. It's still no, it, I meant it'll, better. 
No, it's it's still the same, but maybe audio should... settings. Let me try this. Speakers. No. Microphone. Hmm. What about now? How do, how does that sound now? Still it's, the same? Yeah, it's the same. Huh. Very strange. It's good enough though. We can we can go with it. You would you rather just be dump the headphones for a moment or how, do you want me to do them with it? If it's not helping, but yeah, let's, let me look at this and see if there's something on here. Oh, hmm. How does that sound? Does that make any difference? No, nah, it's the same. Okay, I thought maybe if I press that button here. Try, try on, try on plugging them. Okay. Maybe, and then how does that sound? Maybe my ears are just off and it was in. All right. Uh, all right. This is me without. Talk again. And this is me now with him. This is me now with him. All right. Yeah, just leave him there. Okay. Yeah, it'll be it'll be fine. It's, it still sounds good enough. Okay. All right. Here we go. We'll hop right into it. <clears throat> Welcome back to Banner Monday. Each week here in our second segment, we zoom out to take a look at how things are going across the Big Ten Conference. And there is no one better to provide insight on Big Ten basketball and the Hoosiers than Mike DeCourcy, who covers Big Ten hoops for BTN. In addition to his columns for the Sporting News, Mike, welcome back to Banner Monday after another strong week for the conference. Absolutely a strong week for the conference. Could have been a little better. Uh, Purdue had a shot uh, to win down at Texas and, and couldn't quite get a last uh, second shot off. Uh, that, that, that was a difficult circumstance, but, uh, all in all, uh, you know, the, the end of the early conference swing was good. Uh, it was really entertaining basketball. And then, uh, to have Michigan state go down to Florida and get a win, that was certainly helpful. The Hoosiers, of course, uh, so Marquette had a chance, excuse me, Wisconsin had a chance at Marquette as well, going into overtime. So really close to being perfect, but still a strong week for the big 10 and, I think they're, they, they keep surviving these tests that uh, either would nullify or verify the great success they had prior to the ACC challenge. And they keep uh, sort of at the very minimum doing what they need to do to keep their standing overall. Yeah. Well, speaking of doing the minimum minimum that you need to do, Indiana gets a one point <laughs> victory over Louisville. So they do exactly that. What were your impressions of Indiana's victory over Louisville as well as the win over Penn State earlier in the week? Well, I thought it was good for them because I didn't think they played well in either game. Uh, they had played well at times in each of those games. But for the, for the most part, for the balance of both games, I think you'd say the arrow was pointing down in a lot of ways for those two 40-minute stretches, and they still found a way to win. And it, 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 some of that can be looked at as the product of, of still continuing to work players back in from extended injury absences and extended development absences, missing a chance to work with the team really for the better part of the month. I think Devontae Green is starting to play very well and doing some very good things. I, I, that he was very important to the Penn State win and had some good moments against Louisville. Still uh, waiting to see the best of Zach McRoberts. Uh, I, I think that's, you know, if, if there's anything they want to get done during finals week, as they prepare for the Crossroads Classic. I think that might be the single biggest item on their agenda is getting Zach back to, to being really comfortable because he's not, you know, he's never going to be a 20 point scorer on, on average. He might get a 20 point game, but and that's not who is who he is or what his identity is, but he's not doing Zach McRoberts things right now. And that, you know, that's problematic for the Hoosiers because when he's at his best, he adds so much. Yeah, and you know Indiana with a week now, no games to so just practice, and it it feels like it comes at a perfect time for Indiana because you know I think you know you're right. I mean, a lot of the play against Penn State and Louisville was not what you want to see, and I think you know Archie has kind of alluded to it, and, and we've said it as well. You know the injuries, you know the lack of chemistry that that brings because you don't have the full complement of players there to practice. That seems to be able to explain some of it, and maybe we'll kind of you know be able to test that hypothesis a little bit now that they should have a full week of practice and to kind of see how they come out and perform against Butler in the crossroads. Well, you know, I think the best thing about Indiana's circumstance right now is they have lots to fix, but not but no major wounds to bind. I mean, and I, I don't mean that 
literally, I mean that figuratively. It, it, when you when you play poorly or, or play below your standard, I should say, it wasn't poor, but you play below your standard or the standard you're shooting to reach and still win. I mean, that's what you call a high class problem. Uh, you, okay, you got, you, you know, I always say that you, there most of the lessons that you can learn in a game of, of college basketball, you can learn by winning as much as by losing. I mean, humility might be the only one that you can't learn by playing below your standard, below what you want to reach and still winning the game. And you can look at that Penn State game. and I mean, they played the first eight minutes and scored four points, I believe, was the total. Four points in eight minutes. And they came back to have a great uh, second segment of the first half. They did really well uh, with Romeo playing maybe his best basketball to date in the in those in that 10 minute stretch what would what would amount to the second quarter uh if this were a pro game or a women's game uh and and then they were able to fight through in the second half against Penn State and they were able to come back against Louisville in a game with you know that the, playing a good team that was inspired and, and had a lot to play for and and they and they were able to come back and get a victory so I think that there's a lot to be uh, pleased with and like I said, I think the biggest thing is getting getting guys used to roles, uh, especially since you had to redefine them during the absence period, and then also getting Zach back comfortable with the style and the and the nature of his game and getting him back into that. Indiana's won a lot of close games recently, and we were talking in the first segment. I don't know if you heard about Archie Miller's track record as a coach in close games, and you know he's he's been one of the more successful coaches in the country in terms of winning games that are decided by five points or fewer. Do you have any hypothesis for what makes his teams good in those kinds of situations? Well, I think when you have a coach who does that well, and, you know, I, I always got to get get a kick out of. Um, you know, uh, when people uh, in certain fields call it luck, you know, that, you know, <laughs> basically that you're going to win and lose the same number of those over time. Well, I mean, I guess if it's 20 years, maybe, <laughs> but, you know, really good teams, really well coached teams and really smart teams are going to win those uh, those games more often than they lose them because they know how to make winning plays. And I think that for Arch, I mean, he, he's very calm under pressure. I think he's got a great basketball mind that goes back to you know who he's who he's who he's worked for, his brother uh, Herb Sendek, uh, Thad Mata, and also who he grew up learning under, which was you know quite ob quite obviously his father. Um, he's got a great basketball mind that he spent a lot of time developing, and and part of it also is having players who respond to that, who who respond to pressure. I mean, it's it's harder to play well when the game is on the line and, and those guys have done that consistently. They did it at Northwestern. They did it at Penn state and they did it at Louisville. Uh, and, and you keep doing that and it's not an accident. And it's not luck. It's you respond well to pressure. And the nice thing is that if you look at that, it's not one guy that carried you through all of those games. It was multiple play. Yeah, you had Romeo's great bucket in the Northwestern game, certainly, but you had Devonte play well at the end of that game and, 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 you had uh, some big plays at Penn State that, that you know Robert Finnessy made, and so there were lots of different guys that contributed to all of that. And so I think that shows that you know that that you have a, a well coached team. And there and there's one thing that I can't speak to for sure, um, but I would be surprised if it weren't the case. And that is the coaches who usually do well in this. And I've never ar asked Arch about this, but the coaches who do well in these circumstances prepare for them. You know, they, they, they you know the the the, you know, okay, there's 30 seconds on the clock. You're down three. How do we win the game? And then you go over that and go over that. So when you get into the game, it's not just hope. It's a plan. Yeah. All right. Well, let's take a look at the Big Ten. Let's start with your current power rankings. What's your current top four? And where does Indiana fall in the pecking order? I think this is my first week of having the Hoosiers in the list. Hey, okay. Uh, there you go. So you know, <laughs> those three victories were all against high major opponents, one of them on the road. Uh, two of them, I, I think, will be tournament contenders. Uh, so I think that was all, you know, very important for them. Um, you know, I, it starts with the obvious Michigan. Uh, Andy Katz from NCAA.com has Michigan number one in the nation. I think that's ambitious. Uh, they have played really well. Uh, but I, you know, I think at this point it's hard to say uh, when other teams can throw, you know, five NBA guys on the floor at a time. 
uh, that I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily think that's the case with Michigan and I don't think they're the best team in the country. Uh, but I think they're certainly have been the best team in the big 10. Uh, number two, uh, Michigan state, uh, again, a lot of talent there starting to find you know, some star level performances. Uh, Cassius Winston is playing like a star. Josh Langford is playing like a first option. I think they're start they, Xavier Tillman coming off the bench down in Florida and having such a big game. So they're showing they're showing that. I still, you know, I'd like to see more consistency out of Nick Ward, but uh, overall they've played really well. Uh, Wisconsin at number three would be. I think they'd been number two if they hadn't lost in overtime at Marquette. And I was a little surprised that Demetric Price had the trouble he did in that game. I'm going to put that down to the fact that uh, yeah, Marcus Howard just makes you work so much on D. I mean, it's a it's a full-time job. And they did get Marcus, even though he had 27 points, I think he had 27 shots. So I think they did pretty well on him. But they need, you know, Wisconsin to win games like that. Can't can't get 10 points from Demetri Trice. I just, you know, if Brad Davison's not going to score, and, and that's a team that, you know, they need to get Brad Davison back to playing Brad Davison basketball. Um, had, a, had a zero in that game. He's really struggling. Uh, so they, they need Trice to score more than what he did. And then Indiana at number four. And it's a close call. I think Ohio State, you know, has those two road wins, which stands well for them. Uh, but I don't think that their schedule since has been as challenging and as daunting as Penn State's, excuse me, as, as Indiana's. Uh, and that's why the Hoosiers get the nod at this point. Uh, but the, yeah, Nebraska as well. I think Nebraska and Ohio State, either one of them could be in that slot. Uh, but the Hoosiers have done more and I'm a big achievement guy. You know, I'm not a, I, I, you know, I, I understand the value of analytics relative to if you're going to gamble. And also uh, if you're, you know, if you're on the bench or in the, you know, in the huddle, you know, you have to know, you know, what are trends, what are strengths, uh, you know, what works most and all those kinds of things. But um, you know, from the standpoint of, of judging teams, I don't necessarily care how many you win by. It just doesn't matter to me. By the way, you mentioned Marquette. Indiana's victory over Marquette has aged pretty well because they've, they've had some impressive performances since then. So that's one of those. You want the Big Ten to win, but if you're an Indiana fan, at least it was Marquette that beat the Big Ten <laughs> right, team. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> That'll help out. Um, okay, so let, let, let's look around the conference some more. Wh who are some players, maybe some teams around the conference that caught your eye this week that we haven't really talked about much yet this season? Well, you know, I would like to say, you know, even though we have kind of talked about Northwestern before, I thought Vic Law on Saturday, and you, know, you guys were getting ready for uh, for the Hoosiers and, and all that, but the, the DePaul Northwestern game, that was maybe Northwestern's biggest game of the year to date. They had to have it. It was a home game uh, against a team that could go either way. Uh, you know, it could turn out to be a bad loss or it could turn out to be, a you know, a at least a uh, respectable win. And they were down big. I mean, they were down high double digits. Uh, I don't remember what the number exactly got to, but it was it was it was significant. And and they and they came back, and it was mostly Law that did it. So that was an enormous win for them, and an enormous performance uh, for Vic Law. He was outstanding. Well, right? they outscored them thirty-four to thirteen down the final ten minutes of the game. Holy they smokes. had they had a they had a run that got to at least twenty-two nothing, and it might have gotten to twenty-four. And again, it was it was mostly Law uh, getting that done. He was outstanding in that stretch. It was a it was a circumstance where the guy said, "We can't lose this game," and I'm taking it on. My and he had a lot of help from Pardon and some guys, but that was he was the biggest part of that. You know, I thought Ethan Happ, even though they didn't win the uh, the the Wisconsin game, uh, he was just mesmerizing. Uh, it, it just uh, it, it's as well as I've ever seen him play. I, I, I will say this about Ethan Happ. I don't know how you can be so good at your footwork, your hands, your post ups, and all of that. And 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 you know, and and I know he's working on things, but how can, how he could be so uncomfortable shooting the basketball? I'll never understand it because he's so. I mean, he is he is a plus plus at all those other things I described, and probably C minus at shooting the basketball, and that may be generous. Ryan, who was just on here before, is like the biggest anti-Ethan Happ fan. Not that he doesn't appreciate the skills that he brings to the game, but has just never liked him. So we can have a positive conversation about Ethan Happ with him not here. Um, but, you know, he is, Happ is so interesting. He, I mean, he's one of the most unique players I've ever seen in my time, you know, watching the Big Ten for that very reason. You know, to be so skilled in some areas and then just so almost totally deficient in other areas. And you know exactly what he's going to do and, you know, 
you can't some people would say he travels but whatever you can't stop it <laughs> so <laughs> you can't you know. <laughs> and he's a great passer too that's the other thing he has covered ball handling passing post-ups unbelievable shooting so uncomfortable it's it's yeah. it's a it's a mystery another team uh that you know maybe saved their season uh was was uh minnesota with their comeback mm-hmm. against nebraska uh, if they had lost that game they would have been i believe they would have been one of the teams that went to zero and two in the league and 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 it was would, they would have had a home loss and i i think it would have really been difficult for them now they have a high quality win that's going to stand up and so yeah, they can get back on. They, they've got real deficiencies there, uh, but uh, you know they they were able to fight through them in that game. Uh, you know, I, I thought that uh, I thought they did a nice job. Jordan Murphy inside uh, was terrific, and I, I thought that they they really did well in that game to fight back from the deficit that they had. You know, against against one of the league's best teams, uh, it was really impressive. I want to ask you about Purdue. You know, on the one hand, they obviously have one of the best players in the country in Carson Edwards, you know, and they have four losses, but you look at them individually, none of those four losses are bad. Virginia Tech on a neutral court, Florida State, Michigan, Texas, all the way, you know, and those were all for the most part uh, uh, close, except for obviously the Michigan loss. But they're six and four. The computers still love them because they're 15th in Ken Palm. And yet it, it feels like the Texas game kind of showed a template for how you defend them or how their season might go, which is you let Carson Edwards get his and you force the other guys to beat you. And do they have any other guys who are going to be good enough to do that? Like, how do you project them forward? Because they seem like a a, a very compelling swing team in the Big Ten in terms of where their season could go. You know, I felt bad for Purdue because, in part because I don't understand why people burdened them with high expectations. They were a preseason top 25 team for almost everybody. Um, and I didn't, I didn't understand it. And I, I just, I look, I I have the highest respect for Matt. So if you said, well, it's just because they have a great coach. Okay. Um, but that's not the end of it. It, You're asking so much of one player in Carson Edwards and he's delivering a ton and they just, I don't think there's enough there. I, I think that every game is going to be a fight for them. And that's not to say they can't win enough games to get to the tournament and then fight their way through to get, you know, a couple there because they have, you know, one of the nation's best players. There's no question about that. And they have a few useful players beyond that. But the, where they really struggle is that um, Nojel Eastern has point guard skills and doesn't always play like a point guard. And what I mean by that is that he doesn't get the ball, other than those times when he says, here, Carson, take it and do whatever. <laughs> I don't think Eastern often enough says, okay, here's where we're going to cut the defense apart by what we do execution wise or what I can do with my creativity because he is a creative player, but there were circumstances in that game where they had a shot clock violation once and they should never have a shot clock violation. Um, and they just, you know, when you've got, when you've got uh, Carson Edwards on your team, you should never have a shot clock violation. It just shouldn't happen uh, because he can create a shot out of nothing. Even if it's, you know, even his, I mean, he scored, <laughs> this is true. In that game, he scored from like Houston and Port Arthur. I mean, and what I mean by that is there's a map of Texas on the on the court that's their center court, right? And he's standing on what would probably be Houston, and he makes like a 35 footer. And he did that again. I think he was a little up, so I think it was Port Arthur or whatever. But I mean, it, it was ridiculous. So how you get a shot clock violation? Well, that's because your point guard's not taking command, and so that's so that's part of it. Uh, I think. I, 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 I didn't necessarily think they had um, a good circumstance. I, I don't know that they anticipated well enough that they, the, on the last possession, the last key possession, that they would double hard on Carson Edwards and try to get the ball out of his hand, and then they didn't have an answer for that. Uh, Why wouldn't you? Exp- How else would you defend Purdue? It seems well, like the obvious defense against. Well, him. It, it, you, if you looked at it, he got the ball to uh, to, Ryan, to to Klein there, and Klein didn't seem to want to have anything to do with it. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's got to at that point, and I know uh, that the that the, the you know that they were open in the corner, and but it, you were sending the ball down to a non-ball handler, and so you wind up with the turnover, and that just you know I, I I really thought that they just did not play that last possession with the way they the, with, the, with the intelligence that they normally would. Uh, that was it, it was not who you know it was not their their identity, but again it goes back to 
having a point guard play like a point guard. And I know he's unconventional because he's six, five, six, six, and there's a lot of things he can do beyond being a point guard. But there are times when if the, if the other team's going to try to take away Edwards, then the point guard has to say, okay, I'm going to make execution happen. And, and I haven't seen that enough from him. It's crazy. Edwards is taking almost 40% of Purdue shots when he's on the floor and using 37% of their possessions. That's high, high numbers for Carson. Good usage, though. He's great. I mean, <laughs> he is. I mean, and, he, and he's being efficient with it, too, to his credit. I mean, he's having a really, really good season. So um, let's look around the conference kind of coming up. What, I mean, obviously, you know, Indiana, Butler, Purdue, Notre Dame are important games to look for this weekend. What other games should, uh, should Big Ten fans, IU fans, be keeping a close eye on? Well, you know, when I was in college, and it's been a long time, but even though it's been many years, we had finals too. Uh, they, they had invented them by then. And, and finals week was certainly no fun as a student. And now all these years later, it's no fun for us either as fans uh, or, or journalists or whatever. As, as, as consumers of college basketball, finals week stinks. Um, so there's not a lot of games. Uh, it's, it's a chance to breathe before the conference gauntlet begins. <laughs> it's great for the teams. And yeah. like I said, you know, you can use that to, to make some improvement as well as obviously they have to study and all that. But um, all that dumb stuff. Uh, but uh, but so we don't have a lot of games going into uh, Saturday. Saturday with the crossroads, that takes up two of the, of the league's key teams. Uh, playing big games, so a lot happening uh, at uh, Banker's Life on Saturday. I will be there looking forward to that. Uh, beyond that, you have NC State uh, going to Penn State. Well, no, nah, uh, no, we can't play the game on campus. Uh, they're going to Atlantic City to play oh, Penn yeah. State. Uh, uh, gosh only knows why they're doing that, but uh, that's an important game for the league. Nebraska Oak State playing in the Dakotas. I believe it's South Dakota, but it's not <laughs> – it's not – Nebraska, that's play. They're not playing in Nebraska. Uh, they're playing on a neutral site, I believe. Like I said, I believe it's South, uh, South Dakota that uh, hmm. Nebraska will play Oak State, and and that's one you have to get because Nebraska, uh, Oak State's not a great team. Uh, and then the other big game on the weekend, and this one's a tough one, is Rutgers and Seton Hall. Uh, that's that's a tough hmm. one to get. Seton Hall just took out uh, took out Kentucky over the weekend. It's not a great Seton Hall team. Uh, but they've got some really good shooters. And, you know, from that standpoint, uh, Rutgers is going to have its hands full. Last question for you. Your thoughts on the Crossroads Classic. Is this something that should continue? And and especially look at it from Indiana's perspective. Is this a tournament that serves Indiana well now and will continue to serve them, you know, as the Archie Miller era goes? And, you know, hopefully from an IU fan's perspective, kind of the national stature of the program grows. My loathing for all non you know neutral court games that aren't exempt tournaments uh multi-team tournaments they call them now i i really can't stand like the fact that uh gonzaga and tennessee played in phoenix yesterday um i know these games are staged for charity but if you want to stage games for charity let's go back and go do what everybody did last season not before last season and play charity exhibitions i mean i'm all for charity don't get me wrong um, but it's not serving the game of college basketball to play one of the best non-conference games of the year at, you know, at a court that's 2000 miles from either school and where you get about 10,000 people to show up. That's just not good for the game. And the, the apotheosis of this was the CBS sports classic a year ago in new Orleans, where there were like 15 people there mm -hmm. and I'm exaggerating, but literally I'm not exaggerating by much. I mean, they, they there couldn't have been a thousand people in that building. So that's bad, but I make an exception for the Crossroads Classic, and not because I live in Indiana, but because I understand what basketball means to Indiana, how special it is to have a circumstance where you can have four high-level Division I teams come together under one roof and play one another, and that they're willing to do it. As long as they are willing to do it, I am all in favor of it, and I hope they remain willing to do it because I think it's great for the sport. Uh, I... It, if there were other states or cities or whatever that have similar circumstances, and I know you could pull it off in Ohio, uh, but Cincinnati lacks the, the the arena that would be worthy of it. So it would mean you're either taking it to Cleveland or playing in Columbus every year. I'm not sure that that's necessarily an equitable deal. Um, there are a few other places that could do it, but Indiana is unique in its appreciation for the game, its love for the game, its passion for the game, and its, uh, and its, uh, uh, facility for the game. 
And so all of those sorts of things combine to make this one of the special events on the calendar. And I hope all four schools remain invested in it. If Indiana could get a higher profile game, do you think they should do that? Or do you think they should stay committed to the crossroads because of kind of what it means to the state? Well, I think that there are other things that could be sacrificed to get a higher profile game. I mean, um, you know, I think that you could say, look, uh, you know, we'd like not to play a Gavit games because we can get, I don't know, um, Duke, let's say, well, gosh, they don't want to play Duke again. That's a bad, it's a bad example. Kentucky, um, Arizona. Uh, <laughs> Kentucky, yes. Uh, let's say Kentucky, because that's obviously been an issue for several years, but I, I don't think that, um, you know, I, I think that uh, Indiana's stance on that game has been reasonable. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with going back and forth home and home and away there. I, I really don't. And now if you, if you want to mix in one, like a four-year series with one in Indy with a split house, one in Louisville with a split house, and then home and home, I'm fine with that. I'd be like we just fine. did with Louisville. One at their place, one at our place, one on a neutral. Yeah, I think that would be fine. Um, I'd be all for that. But I don't think that I, I think, as I said, I think there need to be more games on campus. Yeah. The, the season ticket holder needs to be taken care of more than he and she are for college basketball. You know, you don't have this problem in the NHL. The NHL takes maybe one game a year out of the season ticket holder's hands and plays in a stadium. NFL maybe takes one game a year out and plays it in London. But, and that, but that hits like two teams or three teams – uh, you know, in a year. So, I mean, you've got 32 teams. So you're like, that's like a one every 10 years, something like that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, that's from that standpoint, it's not the same, but college basketball is doing it like every day. And it's yeah. just not good for the season ticket holder. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly on that. Well, Mike, thank you as always for joining us here on Banner Monday. We always appreciate your insight and we look forward to doing it next week after the Crossroads Classic. And we'll get all of your reaction to what should be a fun Saturday of basketball. I'm looking forward to it, Jared. Thanks. All righty, coming up, it is time for Basketball 201. Ben Ladner is here to talk about Indiana's offense, especially how much more comfortable the Hoosiers are when they are playing inside out going through the post. Stick with us here on the Assembly Call. All right. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. I enjoyed it, Jared. That was great. Me too. Are you? You'll be there at the crossroads, obviously. I will. Yeah, I've got yep. uh, got a thing I have to do. I have to interview Corey Joseph for one of our uh, side projects. I have to do a video interview with him, which they have they practice, and then I have to do it like so. I'm going to miss part of the first game, um, but I will be down there. I may show up, leave, and then come back. I'm not sure. It depends on when exactly we pin down the time for the interview. Who plays first? Is it Notre Dame Purdue? Uh, yes, I believe that's correct. Okay. Cool. Well, it should be a fun. Well, I mean, you know, th this the Crossroads Classic always seems to go better for us when we're playing Notre Dame. So hopefully we can exercise some <laughs> yes. defense this weekend. There you, go. there you go. I remember some of those games well. Absolutely. Oh. I'm sure not with the, quite the pain you do, but <laughs> no. I know the feeling. No. Well, I, I think our style now will be more well suited to matching up against Butler. I would hope. I think you're right. Cool. Thank you, Mike. All right. Thanks, Jared. Yep. Take care. See you. Okay. And let's bring in noted North Carolina basketball fan. Yeah. But committed IU basketball analyst, Ben Ladger. That's right. <laughs> uh, so did I promote that right? Is that what we're talking about today? Does that still yeah. work? Okay. Yeah. Sweet. Well, let's... Uh, are you going to the crossroads, by the way? I'm not. I'm uh, driving back to Atlanta on Friday. So I'll be oh, you watching are? it on TV. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's right. For winter break. Yep. When, uh, when do you guys come back then? Uh... Like the seventh, maybe whatever that Monday is closest to. Okay, so after the Illinois game, I think yes. the Illinois game is on the third. Sorry, I think about everything in terms yeah, yeah, of after Indiana's the basketball game. schedule. Yep. yep. So it's it's like the <laughs> second Monday of uh, of January, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Sweet. All right, man. Well, let's uh, let's hop into this and talk about some offense. Are they are all your clips from the Louisville game? Um, most of them are, and a couple are from other points in the season. Okay, sweet. Well, here we go. <clears throat> Welcome back to Banner Monday. You know, here at the Assembly Call, we don't just want to make you a smarter IU basketball fan. We want to make you a smarter basketball fan, period. 
And that is the purpose of these Basketball 201 segments where we really dive deep, sometimes doing deep film sessions on IU, sometimes just talking about general basketball concepts. And I'm here with Ben Ladner, who kind of you know runs us through uh, these segments, one of our interns, our joint interns with, uh, with Inside the Hall this year, a senior at IU, um, really doing a great job. And, uh, and, and Ben, one of the questions that we've been getting, you know, we, we kind of went through Indiana's offense and the pack line and ball screens. And a question that people have had through the first 10 games of this season is some variation of what is Indiana doing on offense? Like what kind of offense are we running? Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we noticed that you and I noticed this weekend, you know, watching the Louisville game and obviously watching some previous games is how much more comfortable Indiana has seemed when they're playing through the post, playing inside out, which shouldn't be a surprise to anybody because Archie talks about it every single time he talks about their offensive philosophy. So, you know, that is kind of the answer to what this team wants to do offensively. And you have some videos to show us and and talk through for those listening on the podcast that kind of illustrate this. Yeah. So when, when we first kind of got that inquiry from the, the listenership, I guess, um, I actually didn't have a, a great answer off the top of my head, other than it's a lot through the post uh, with with Deron Davis and then you know more more importantly Jawan Morgan. And so the first thing I did when I was just kind of looking into this was I dove into some of the the synergy play tracking numbers, um, which I think are are really useful just in terms of like getting you know a, an analytical sense of like what's happening, and then you can kind of dive into the film from there. So. In fact, the, the, they, they do play out of the post a, a pretty decent amount of time. And the way Synergy tracks these sorts of things um, kind of, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't give you quite the full picture, which is why we, you know, have the film and all that kind of stuff. So the, the, the main kind of play type that Indiana runs per Synergy is, is actually spot up. They do that about 21% of their possessions end in some sort of spot up attempt. And they score over a point per possession on those types of plays, which is an excellent mark. That's in the 88th percentile nationwide. The second most common you, is you want, you want to define spot up real quick and how synergy defines it. Cause like, for example, the three pointer yeah. that Rob Finnessy hit to make it 60, 58, that was a spot up opportunity. He's right. standing so there, gets a shot. He's open. He makes it. Yeah. It's basically a catch and shoot jump shot. That's, you know, when usually you'll see them kind of inside out kind of looks where it's either a drive and kick or it's through the post and a kick out pass against a double team or something like that. That's typically where they come from. It's basically if you see a catch and shoot three, that's generally going to be considered a spot up. And and spot up also can um, includes like if you catch and shoot and then attack the closeout and then you know take a couple dribbles and finish a layup. That also is included in spot ups. So uh, it, it it's that's how it differs from catch and shoot is because you can actually take some dribbles and still have it considered a spot up. But yep. that's the most common type of play that Indiana gets in their offense. The second most is transition at about 21% or 20% of the time. And they're actually not that great scoring and transition efficiency wise. They're only in the 25th percentile league wide. And it's, it's funny because transition, you know, like if you just compare it number for number across play types, it's not bad. You know, it's a, it's pretty close. It's actually better than their post-up numbers, but because teams generally do better in transition than they do in the half court, you know, you, you really, you know, you need to have a really, really excellent mark and transition for it to be, you know, an above average mark. So IU is actually not, you know, one of the most, you know, one of the better teams in the country in transition this season. Is that Post- probably because we turn the ball over a, and we yeah. don't get a lot of transition threes Would that kind of account for some of that? Yeah. The transition threes are a big part of it because, you know, when you're attacking the basket, you know, if you, if you miss a layup, you know, that's, that's a missed opportunity. And, you know, the upside is only two points versus, the downside of zero transition turnovers are, are huge. And that's a big reason why a lot of the times guards have pretty bad transition numbers because they're the ones that are handling the ball. And so if, if the ball is going to get turned over, it's usually by a guard. Whereas with bigs, their main job in transition is just to catch and finish. And so usually they have much better transition numbers than guards do. And so if you see a guard with like a really, really high transition efficiency, that's generally a good sign because he's not turning the ball over and he's also finishing at a high rate, but yeah, yeah, the the threes are also a big part of it. You know, I, I, that's, I can't remember a time where Indiana has taken a transition three this season. It's just not really something that Archie Miller wants. You know, the the quick three is, is basically the antithesis of, of Indiana's offense, but post-ups only check in at about 10% of Indiana's offense right above pick and roll ball handler, which we'll touch on a little bit as well. And the reason for that is not because they're not playing through the post more than that, but because that only tracks the amount of times they're finishing plays 
through the post. So only about 10 and a half percent of their shots are actually taken out of the post. But as we'll, as we'll see here, the post accounts for a, a really large portion of their offense when you factor in passing out of the post and just the actions they're able to create because of it. So the first clip that I want to show is, I think, from the Marquette game. And if you, uh, if you, you know, follow my Twitter feed over the next couple of days, I, I've got an article coming out on Jawan Morgan, and you'll see this clip in that piece as well, um, which basically details you know, how he's kind of evolved as a passer over the last year or so. But this is against Marquette, second half, 18-18 to play, 23 on the shot clock. And like a lot of Indiana possessions, they're starting with Jawan Morgan on the left block in the post. And so you've got Rob Finnessy's just giving the ball to Al Durham here on the left wing. And you can kind of see at the start of this clip, he's, he's clearing through to the weak side here and he's actually going to end up getting the ball. So keep an eye on him as well, but they go into Jawan Morgan. He catches and you can see him immediately. He's going to look up now, Justin Smith's man here. Number 10 is, is already sagging toward the post. He knows that, you know, Jawan Morgan is a threat. He's a weapon in the post and Marquette is keying in on him. So he's going to go double and these two guys on the weak side, Marcus Howard, and I can't remember number one's name, but they're basically zoning up on, on this, you know, kind of three-man set that Indiana has here, and Al Durham's going to cut through to the weak side as well. So they're basically clearing out for Jawan Morgan. And so what, what happens is Justin Smith is going to cut straight down the middle, and watch as the double team comes, Smith times his cut almost exactly with the double team. And so you see both of these defenders – are watching Justin Smith because he's such a great cutter. Romeo Langford's going to kind of creep up closer to the top of the key. And because of that, Rob Finnessy is left wide open on the weak side. And Juwan Morgan is a fantastic passer. He sees it. And so kind of all put together fast motion. You know, these are, these are pretty regular plays for Indiana. When teams double team Juwan Morgan, he's really, really good at getting rid of the ball and finding guys on the perimeter. So Indiana gets a lot of, a lot of their threes come from plays like that, where it's give the ball to the post inside, see what the defense does. If you can't score out of the post, you get a wide open three. There was a play in the Duke game where uh, on the right block, Jawan Morgan, you know, took one dribble, saw that Evan Fitzner's man was sagging in and he kicked it right out to Fitzner for a left corner three. And when you have a weapon like Jawan Morgan, you're able to create a lot of really good action on the weak side like that, just because you're going to draw so much attention from defenses. And so while Indiana, you know, doesn't score, through the post as much as some other teams, they generate so much of their offense through the post, whether it's, you know, direct layups and spins and hooks or whatnot, or, you know, passes out and, and kind of finding, finding looks in other ways. And we talked earlier in the show about how Indiana doesn't take a lot of threes, but they are doing a pretty good job this year, better than average at making three pointers. Part of the reason for that is exactly what you saw right there. That's a really good look for Rob Finnessy. So, you know, he should make a solid percentage of those. And you just don't see a lot of Indiana players creating three-pointers or shooting them off the dribble. So you're getting a lot of them, you know, through the offense, through a pass in the post like that. And, you know, you're not getting them in transition. So that's why the number of attempts is lower. But with the, and with this personnel, I think that works because Indiana just doesn't yeah. have a lot of guys that are going to create and make a lot of three-pointers. But when they get them like that, you know, those, those are exactly the ones that they need to be taking. Yeah, and we saw Rob Finnessy hit a couple really big spot up three pointers late in that Louisville game. One of which um, we'll we'll get to in a few clips here. But the next kind of play type I want to touch on is the pick and roll, which again only accounts for about ten percent of Indiana's offense, nine point nine per synergy. Um, they've only run seventy nine pick and roll possessions this season, and thirty four of those have have been run by Romeo Langford. And so it's with, a, with a really high efficiency rate, right? He's been pretty really good high, leading the pick almost yeah. 1.3 points per possession, which is in the 97th yeah. percentile nationwide. So yeah, obviously that's a, a fantastic do it more coach. Do it more. <laughs> and that's what I was going to get to is like, as a team, Indiana's in the 74th percentile on pick and roll efficiency, but you know, it's only like 10% of their offense. So I think, you know, I, I, my instinct is that at some point the coaching staff is going to realize, okay, we have this amazing pick and roll weapon in Romeo Langford, who I think is, is even a pretty good passer out of the pick and roll as well. And mm -hmm. could do that more often if he were allowed to. But I, I think at some point they're probably going to realize like, Hey, this is probably something we should do more often because we just have this guy who's so good at it. So because, because Juwan is also extremely effective as a screener in the pick exactly, and roll because he can pop, he can roll. So the two of those guys together, I agree. I think we'll see that a lot more as the season goes on. 
Or, yeah, and it's and it's it's kind of that that philosophy of just put your two best players in a play together. You know, yeah. sometimes it's as simple as that. You know, just get your two best players, run a pick and roll, and good things will happen. Yeah. So I, I don't have a clip of Romeo scoring out of pick and roll because we all know how well he can do that. Um, but here, the, this clip from the Louisville game is kind of a good illustrator of when when teams take away that initial role, what do they do out of that? And as you might guess, um, it involves going through the post. And so here. In the Louisville game, early second half, uh, IU down by seven. Romeo Langford and Deron Davis pick and roll, top of the key. And so Langford is going left, kind of. Yeah, into the, the video. The video is not up. You need to share your screen. Oh, it's not. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I'll share my screen real quick. Sorry, podcast I'm listeners. So so excited to, to get to it. I got ahead of myself. And remember, if go. you want to watch the video, this is episode four fifty four on YouTube. Go about an hour in, and you'll see the the video of this segment. Okay. So now we've got the pick and roll, Romeo Lang for Deron Davis up top. Romeo's going to drive left. And Louisville, you know, like Indiana does a lot of the time, they're going to bring that big man out. It's not quite a full hedge, but it's kind of this, it's kind of a high drop. When we talked about pick and roll coverages early in the, the year, you can go back and check those episodes out if you need a refresher. But, you know, this is kind of a variant of the drop coverage, which is, you know, bring that big guy out about to the level of the ball, make sure Langford can't turn the corner or pull up for a jump shot. And then they're going to have help on the roller, Deron Davis. He's actually open right here, but because they have two guys on Langford, uh, he doesn't see Davis. And so, you know, you swing the ball onto the perimeter, and then Indiana kind of just transitions into another set. Louisville's able to recover, but Deron is going to get that seal on the left block and basically just go to work. And so it, it's kind of this idea that it all kind of comes back to the post for Indiana. You know, if that's their bread and butter. If something isn't working, if they run a set, run a play, they don't get something they like out of it. It's kind of their, you know, their their instinct and their natural tendency is just to revert back to the post because that's where they're comfortable. That's where they want to play through. Also, you know, so much of this is context and player dependent. So you said, you know, Duran was open on the roll and he was. But even if Romeo could have gotten him the ball, that doesn't strike me as a good position for Duran to be right. in because he's so much better when he's settled and kind of you know has his feet set and he gets it because then he uses his footwork and he can beat anybody to the basket. So I actually feel like being patient and where he got the ball was a much better spot for him even if they'd found him when he rolled. Yeah, and Duran's not really a guy who's going to catch and go up and finish over people. You know, he he needs to kind of have space, have some time. He can put his his uh, shoulder into guys' chests and kind of go through guys. But as far as just finishing over the top as, as like a dunk threat, that's just not really his game. He doesn't really have the physical profile for that. No, it's so, funny. It's like all of a sudden when he gets the ball in the post, he becomes like a ballerina. And his footwork was, is so I was, amazing. <laughs> I was When I was watching film in preparation for this, I noticed that as well. Like he had this play defensively where like someone spun on him and he barely even moved. And then he gets the ball on the other end of the floor and he does the exact same thing and spins right by someone for an and one and finishes the layup and he's so quick and has such great footwork on offense yeah. and it's just on defense he's almost like the Enos Cantor of college basketball where like you see the agility and everything on on offense and then on defense it just isn't there take a drink if you're playing the Ben Ladner NBA player comp <laughs> drinking game during segment three here of the assembly call <laughs> great game to play at 4 15 in the afternoon yes <laughs> so here's a another clip from the Louisville game this was one of my favorite plays of the entire game actually um and it's it's you'll you'll soon see why it's, it's another kind of variation of the pick and roll where again Louisville is gonna they're gonna send two guys to Romeo but because and and we'll see here because the plays run on the right side of the floor I'll go ahead and let it run so this is kind of where it starts Langford comes off an Iverson cut off of a Smith screen at the elbow to the right wing and because they're running a a, a side pick and roll or I guess a middle pick and roll from the side um, there are more options as far as as pressure release valves i guess like on that other play you just even if you swing the ball to the the perimeter you don't really have the angle to to hit the, the roll man um at least not like on the roll as you saw it kind of took davis posting up and taking his time to really get in position but here you have a more agile screener in justin smith and he's going to have more space to work with on this role and so when romeo comes off the screen jordan wara comes out and basically double teams and deron davis does a really smart thing here he spaces the floor, and, and you might think, you know, Deron Davis not really a floor spacer because he can't shoot threes. He's not really a threat to go off the dribble, do things with the ball in his hands. But if you have the ball in your hands, you are inherently a floor spacer because, you know, when you have the ball, opponents have to guard you or else you're just, you know, if, if this guy is sinking back in the lane, and Deron's just going to go up to the Big Ten logo 
put the guy on his back and then shoot a layup. He's just going to have all that space. And so you'll see, you know, you see a lot of teams do this with non shooters as a way to kind of open up space on the floors, just use them with the ball in their hands because then defenses have to guard them as opposed to if they don't have the ball, defenses don't have to respect them. And so when Romeo swings the ball to Duran, first of all, smart play by, by Davis coming up and offering this pressure release valve, because otherwise, you know, Romeo is probably just going to kind of dribble around until the defense can kind of recover and get back to its initial matchups. But Davis kind of keeps the play moving by moving up here to the, to the, the top side. And he's, I think maybe an underrated passer at this point in his career. Definitely. And so he sees basically immediately that Smith is going to be open on the roll here. I mean, you can see how much space he has because his man, Jordan Wara is all the way out on Romeo Langford. And so Duran Davis's man, because he has to come up here to guard Duran and the, the, the floor is spaced on the weak side with Al Durham and Rob Finnessy over here on the left wing, there is no one inside the lane to stop Justin Smith. And so Davis sees that he comes up and just goes inside to Justin Smith. And that's called shorting the pick and roll where when you know that two guys are going to come out to the ball handler, you kind of put this guy on the same plane, the same kind of horizontal plane as the ball handler. So he has this easy pressure release and then you create a better passing angle for the roll man because you can get it going diagonally as opposed to kind of just this straight on angle that, you know, Romeo would have had to, had to use to get the ball to Justin Smith. So a really smart play. I don't know if this was a, a kind of something that they saw on film and knew would happen. And that's why Duran did it. Or if he just kind of, you know, sensed it and kind of had that instinct to come and and help Romeo and create that angle. But either way, a really, really smart play by Duran Davis and Justin Smith, who had a really nice game able to finish for the end one. You know, you mentioned Duran's passing ability and you're right. He is an underrated passer. We've talked a lot about Juwan's passing ability and when you combine that with the fact that the two of them combined in over 100 two-point field goal attempts, most of them near the basket, are shooting about 68% together, this is why Indiana plays through those guys. Because yeah. they can score and they can pass, and it just it opens up so many things for the offense. So, you know, that, it's, just, it's, it's highly efficient, and when they can't take their man to the basket, which is often, they're really good at locating the open guy. Yeah, yeah, it's a great point. And I, I noted that if you were listening to the WIUX radio broadcast, which... I don't know if anyone watching this was, but I, I noted that on the broadcast. And, um, you know, I, I just thought that was a, a beautiful little sequence there, whether it was, again, whether it was improvisation or if it was something scripted that, you know, Archie was telling his guys, hey, they're going to do this. So we need to do this. Either way, I, I thought it was a, a brilliant move there. Everyone listening to this would have gotten more out of listening to your broadcast than a Fox broadcast. Of IU <laughs> I think we can all agree on that. <laughs> that's uh, that's my that's my goal. So but, you know, granted, not not the. Uh, Actually, I'll just I'll just stop there. Um, <laughs> so the uh, the next play here, actually from the Penn State game, and this is this is kind of a a quick hitter, and you and you don't really see a lot of quick hitters from Indiana, which is basically just kind of a set play to kind of spring one guy open, and if it's not there, you transition into your regular half court offense. First of all, Indiana's half court offense was not great against Penn State. It, I thought, especially in the second half, no. it did not look very good. Um, when Romeo Langford was out of the game. They, they didn't really have anyone until Finnessy started taking over late. Didn't really have anyone that could create separation or penetrate the defense or anything like that. Um, they were just really stagnant. It was a lot of kind of isolate your man and dribble, get shut off, kick it back out to someone, try to do the same thing. You know, kind of these hallmarks of a stagnant offense because they just didn't have much creation on the floor. But this was a, a pretty nice bit of, of half-court execution to get Al Durham free. And I, I wrote an article about Evan Fitzner earlier in the week where I basically talked about how, you know, his floor spacing ability is so crucial to Indiana. And I used a lot of clips that illustrated, you know, how he kind of gets in the way sometimes, but also some clips on, you know, how, when he, when he isn't in the way and when he actually does his job as a floor spacer, he can be really valuable for Indiana. And this is one of the clips I used where they're going to bring Al Durham. They're going to, first of all, Finnessy just kind of move over to the wing and they're going to, you see Deron Davis kind of set up around the elbow. They're going to use, him as a, as a back screener for Al Durham. So when he gives up the ball to Romeo, he's going to cut off this back screen and you watch Fitzner who's setting the screen for Romeo to, to kind of get open, to create that passing angle. After he sets that screen, watch, he goes to the perimeter. He comes back out to the wing. And what that does is it pulls Lamar Stevens over with him. Whereas if Fitzner just stays where he is right now, where I've paused it, which is kind of, you know, 12 feet from the basket on the right side, Lamar Stevens has a foot in the paint 
And you'll see when I, when I play the clip again, Al Durham's going to come off this screen and Lamar Stevens is right there. And he's able to just kind of take away the layup. Instead, Fitzner's going to go all the way out to the wing and you see Lamar Stevens is leaving the paint with him. And so when Al Durham comes off this back screen, his man gets caught up and you can, you know, Romeo sees it right away. Al knows it right away. He's going to be wide open and he gets fouled out of the, out of the nice pass from Romeo. So it's that kind of thing where you're, you're leveraging other people's skills to create open looks for other guys. You know, I, I think that Indiana doesn't run much of this. So it, it kind of caught Penn state off guard. You could tell that the, the guy guarding Al didn't really know the screen was coming. And so he wasn't really prepared for it. This was actually what you just talked about was the big issue for Indiana in the final seven minutes of the first half when Clifton Moore was in because he was kind of anchored on the block and it gave Indiana no space to drive and get inside and do the kinds of things that they usually do, which is why Romeo had to keep shooting all the step back jumpers because he couldn't get inside, you know, which is where I mean, you're right, you know, with Evan, he's such a good three point shooter, get out there, space the floor with Juwan and Duran. It's okay because, yeah, they're clogging things up, but you can get it into them and they can score or they can pass. So it's, you know, you want them clogging up the lane. Like, that's okay. Um, But not guys who are more one dimensional and aren't actually a threat to score when they're down there. And I would add that that Justin Smith is another guy who's not really a floor spacer. But I I think you you talked about how Juwan and Duran are able to overcome that with just their their post play. I think Smith is a guy who overcomes that with his cutting. and He's. As, as bad as he's been at certain points this year on offense with the turnovers and, you know, the, the out of control drives and the crazy shots and all that, when he cuts with a purpose and, and when he kind of sees that space and is able to use the runway and go right down the lane, he is explosive. And, and, you know, because Indiana's bigs are such good passers, he's getting the ball in a lot of those cuts and he's really, really effective doing that. So yeah. I think he's another guy you could throw into that category as well. Um, this, this final clip is one and also from the Louisville game one of the the crucial plays of the game. It's a Rob Finnessy three with about a minute and a half left to play in the game. Indiana's down a bucket here, I guess down a point. Um, and, you know, Finnessy said after the game that the play wasn't really designed for him. And that's, at least from my read on it, after watching this clip a few times, that's like kind of true, but also kind of not true. Because to me, this looks like a play that has multiple options where you know, Louisville took away Indiana's first option and Finnessy was kind of that second or third look. So maybe, that, maybe that's what he meant that he just wasn't right. The first yeah. He was on. not the first option on this play though. And, and we'll see why here um, because you know, another kind of thing, they, they like to do this thing where they they'll have the person who's going to get the ball kind of move it from a different spot on the floor. You'll see that in a lot, like in the last clip with Al Durham, he had the ball earlier in the possession, then gave it up and then made his cut. Indiana does that a lot to kind of spring guys open. Same thing here. Jawan Morgan, swinging it to Justin Smith. He's going to get a cross screen from Finnessy. This is the first look. They're going to rotate the ball back over to Romeo. You can see Morgan coming off this cross screen. They want to get him posted up here on the right block. Louisville sends two guys, and so I'll rewind it. You can see both guys, Finnessy's man and Morgan's man, because they're so afraid of what Jawan Morgan can do to them in the post. They're both going to follow Jawan, and after Smith makes that pass, his job is to come down here around the foul line and set this down screen for Rob Finnessy, and he comes off of it wide open. I mean, even the late closeout didn't get close, and he bangs the three. So that's a really nice play execution and play design by Indiana, just knowing what the defense is going to do, how they're going to react to Jawan Morgan. And, you know, we talk about gravity a lot about when, 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 as it pertains to shooters. You know, if you like Fitzner, you know, if you stand behind the three-point line, you're spacing the floor, you're, you're drawing defenders, you're taking them away from the play. I think the same is true of cutters. I think the same is true of roll men. And I think the same is true of elite post players where, you know, by, by getting Jawan the ball in the post on the move, you're able to kind of create more panic in the defense and then bring, you know, kind of offset them and, and make them make a mistake, which is what Louisville did. And Finnessy, you know, he's such a smart player, especially as a freshman, uh, just kind of senses the open space runs through the play and Indiana executes it really, really nicely. And he drained it, which he always seems to do in the clutch. And what you might see happen now the next time is that defenders not, may not be so quick to leave Rob Finnessy. And now you've got Juwan Morgan one-on-one in the block and you need a bucket. I'll take my chances with Juwan. He makes about 72% yeah. of them down there. And the other so. option is that, I mean, look who's passing the ball. It's Romeo Langford. So he's the <laughs> guy that has the ball in his hands for most of this possession. So if you, even if you take away Juwan Morgan and Rob Finnessy, you still have Romeo Langford with the ball in his hands looking to make a play. And so he can either bring Juwan up from the post to set a pick for a pick and roll, 
he can rotate the ball and they can kind of go back into some continuity. He can isolate, he can shoot a three, he can pull up for a mid range. I mean, there's just so many different options you can get out of that. And so, you know, that's something I'd like to see Indiana do a little, a little bit more often, which is, you know, these, these quick hitters, like I was talking about, just these brief little half court sets to get someone, the ball in an advantageous position. And if you don't get the look you want, then fine. You know, you can, you can go through the post, you can kind of run your continuity offense. But I think especially during the times that Indiana's offense gets bogged down, like it did against Penn state, I think they've got some of these tricks in the bag that they can go to where they can kind of unlock some things, get some movement. I think, I think that's where it all kind of starts and stops for Indiana. If the ball's moving, if the players are moving, if they're getting these cuts and these, uh, you know, these rotations and the weak side screening and things like that, their offense is, is really tough to guard because they've got good passers. They've got good cutters. They've got good athletes. It's when guys aren't moving. It's when, you know, it's people are looking to just kind of make something out of nothing that they don't really get the looks that they want. And so I think they could do a better job of that really in all areas off the pick and roll. You have some weak side action out of the post. When you enter the ball, it's not just enter the ball and stand it's enter the ball and Laker cut off the post. It's enter the ball and set a screen for someone else. Enter the ball, cut, you know, run something off the ball just to keep the defense on its toes. And then everybody becomes more dangerous because of it. Yep. Well, Ben, good stuff as always. Excellent insight. Any idea what we want to discuss next week or kind of play it by uh, ear based on what I'll, I'll leave on that Saturday. up to you. If, uh, if you've got any ideas, I don't particularly, I mean, I'll, I'll have that piece on Jawan coming out this yeah. week. So that might be something that could have some overlap with what we talked about today, but I think still might be worth touching on just like the amount of different ways he can hurt a defense with his passing because he's, he's a, a special passer out of the post. Like I've been super impressed with the way he's been able to find guys when, when defenses react to him in the post. Is that a skill that can translate to the next level for him? Even though he's not a guy who projects to play a lot in the post there. Yeah. So that's the thing is, is like uh, he won't have the usage and this, this, they won't, that, that style just won't really be a thing wherever he plays in the NBA, because, yeah. you know, first of all, the post, you know, just isn't really a focal point in the NBA as much, although teams do use it as, as more of a passing mechanism than ever now. Uh, but second of all, I just don't think he'll have the kind of role at that level to, to really do that because the ball just won't be in his hands very often. So it's more yeah. likely that he's going to be more of a, you know, kind of defensive versatile option and then maybe a cutter, you put him in the short corner in the dunker spot. And then if he, if his three point shot, you know, kind of proves to be legitimate, which we don't really know yet this season, that's kind of the big key for him. But as, as far as, uh, you know, the post play, I just think he won't have, he, he's not quite good enough at the next level to really justify the kind of, the kind of usage that he has in college. Yep. All righty. Well, coming up, it is time for our opponent preview segment. Indiana faces Butler on Saturday. The Bulldogs always pose a challenge for Indiana, and this year will be no different. What does Indiana need to do to win? Stick with us. We'll talk about it here on the Assembly Call. All right, man. Good stuff as always, Ben. Thanks. And yeah, I think so. We're, we have we have Banner Monday next week. And then we're not going to do one on the 24th because it's Christmas Eve. Sure. And I don't know if we'll do one on New Year's Eve either. We'll just kind of have to play that one by oh, ear. Oh, yeah. That's right. Um, so we'll see. But we definitely won't do one on the 24th. So, okay. So we'll see. We may take two weeks off, too. I'll let you know. But we'll uh, – Yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe we'll do a little bit more offense next week unless something crazy happens this weekend. Yeah, yeah, that's true. We always got to see what happens in the, in the games themselves. Although, yeah. with, you know – with this long stretch here in finals week, no games like it's it's we won't have a ton of new material unless the Butler game is just crazy. No, you know, you know, at some point I would like to do, you know, something on, you know, like what Justin Smith did Sunday against Louisville, because I thought he played really, really well. And I think, you know, you know, you showed the one play with that really good cut. But I also thought some of the things that he did well were like the little subtleties on defense and like some of the stuff yeah. that you really have to dig into. So at some point, you know, I want to do one of those where we really kind of yeah. dig into that and kind of show you know, like a play where you might not even notice the guy, but it's like, he did that well. He did this well. He did that well because he did this, that guy didn't have to do this and yeah. like kind of get into that. Um, because I sometimes that's, that's it, I mean, it's hard for really anybody, I think to catch that the first time watching. Yeah. Um, so I think doing a few of those will be good. And he would be a prime candidate if he keeps playing well, because when he yeah, plays well, he does a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Like his, as bad as his offense has been at, at moments, like his defense, I think has been consistently, pretty good with maybe the exception of the Arkansas game. 
Oh, yeah. So, okay, so maybe if nothing crazy happens in the Butler game, then maybe we take – and if he plays reasonably well, then maybe we yep. take a quick look at his defense against Lamar Stevens, against yeah. Nora. And even, then, even against Zion Williamson. Yeah. Okay, so maybe maybe we think about doing that. Yeah, I think I think, I think that'd be good. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, enjoy uh, – or well, have I guess good luck with finals week. Is this going to be a stressful week for you? Uh, you know, I've I've got a a big paper that I'm basically done with at this point, and then uh, a brief project that I'll probably do right after this. But aside from that, I've only got one final, and um, it it shouldn't be very difficult. So nice. The, the legwork, most of the legwork is already done. Good. Well, good luck. Let me know when the Morgan article is out. And uh... yeah, it should be like tomorrow or Wednesday. Okay. Sounds good, cool. man. All right, man. Talk to you later. Yep. Take care. All right. The great Ben Ladner. And now let's bring on Josh Wilson. And let's talk about Butler. Uh, We've got a... There we go. What's up, Josh? Hey, Jared. How are you doing? I am doing well, man. I'm doing well. I have not had much time to prep for Butler, so I do not know much about them. So I'm glad that you could be here. Yeah, it's no problem. I did a a podcast earlier today that I put out in... On Butler, I watched uh, some highlights from games earlier this year. So I'm going to try to watch more throughout the week, but I've got a decent feel of what they're about. Cool. All right, well, let's hop into it. We'll try and keep this one, you know, maybe 12, 13 minutes, something like that, and uh, and promote your show in there and let people know that they can get more there and where to subscribe to it. Okay. Um, okay, let me get some intro music, and we will do this. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Welcome back to Banner Monday. Each week here in our final segment, we dedicate it to previewing Indiana's next opponent coming up that week. And this week, it is the Crossroads Classic. We have to wait all the way until Saturday, which isn't great for us as fans because we want as many games as possible. But it's great for the team because they get some time to practice, which, as we talked about, is going to be very important. And here to help us preview Butler is Josh Wilson from the Chat Mob, from the Inside Out podcast. Josh, always great to have you with us. I appreciate you being here, man. Yeah, anytime. I love being on the show. Love being part of the chat mob. So it's it's always great when we can get together. Absolutely. Um, so let's talk about Butler. You know, it's interesting. You look at the Ken Palm numbers right now. Indiana's number twenty five. Butler's number twenty six. Uh, you know, both teams pretty solid on offense. Pretty solid on defense. Like it kind of seems like a really even matchup. Ken Palm has it seventy two to seventy one. Uh, Indiana, but a fifty percent chance of victory. So I mean, this one is about as right down the middle as possible. And given kind of the house of horrors that the Crossroads Classic has been for Indiana against Butler, you know, no Indiana fan could be blamed if they don't have a lot of confidence going into this game. But what I'm hoping, and maybe you can tell me if this hunch is right or wrong, I feel like the style that we're playing now gives us a much better chance to win against a team like Butler that is typically so solid. Like, I feel like they just took advantage of some of our most obvious weaknesses in the past. And I'm hoping, I'm thinking that maybe that won't be the case this year. Yeah, I think you mentioned that. I can't remember if it was, uh, if it was with Mike DeCourse here in the last segment with Ben. But yeah, you know, Miller's system is, you know, similar to Butler. And I think that is going to do a lot of favors for IU this year. And like you said, most fans, we probably wish we were playing Notre Dame this Saturday with how that's gone. <laughs> um, but Butler, they, they present a unique challenge. But I think with how Archie runs the team and the roster he's put together and how the guys have been playing so far, it really is going to present a good opportunity for Indiana. So it seems to me like you know, the biggest thing to talk about with Butler is Kamar Baldwin. He's playing almost 84% of minutes. He uses a lot of possessions. I talked earlier with Mike DeCourcy about how Carson Edwards is using 37% of possessions for Purdue. Kamar Baldwin uses 31% of Butler's possessions, takes 30% of their shots when he's on the court. So he is a high usage, relatively efficient guard, you know, kind of similar to Marcus Howard in that way, although not as efficient, not as explosive as Marcus Howard. And Indiana did a nice job on him. Is there anything maybe from what we saw in the defense against Marquette that could be used as a template for how Indiana wants to guard Butler, or is it not that kind of matchup? Uh, I think, uh, obviously, Baldwin's not as uh, prevalent from the three-point line um, as Marcus Howard, but I think you have to play them the same because, really, you know, he can get downhill pretty quick, uh, much like Marcus Howard. He's just as crafty, if not even more crafty. He's a lefty, so he's kind of – that's a unique defensive situation. 
uh, you know, that Indiana will, will have to play. So, um, yeah, I think if you play him well, you run it. You, you almost kind of want you're OK if he shoots from three. Um, he's not a, he's, he's at not 26 like percent this year. Right. He's not the threat that um, Jorgensen or McDermott is right now. So I think you close out a little short on him, but you want to make him go right. So you want to shade that left hand and, um, you know, he, he kind of him and Al Durham are kind of similar the way they can finish with both hands. But I, I think at the end of the day, you obviously want to go with his weaker hand, albeit it's probably not uh, there's not much of a difference. Um, but, yeah, if you can get him right and, you know, close out short to maybe where he thinks about, you know, you can challenge the three. I think you're going to put yourself in a good spot with him on the offensive end. When I look at just statistically things that Indiana may be able to take advantage of, you know, that kind of feel like it plays into Indiana's hands, this Butler team is not one that gets to the free throw line a lot. So hopefully that will, you know, kind of help Indiana maybe stay out of foul trouble. But they also seem to be putting teams on the free throw line a lot. Um, which plays into Indiana's hands, and they don't block a whole lot of shots. You know, So their interior defense and their height, not huge strengths. And for a team like Indiana that wants to play inside and can score so efficiently inside, it would seem like that is a big I- advantage for the Hoosiers. Yeah, and as much as we've joked about that could come to you know Indiana's detriment just with the free throw shooting as of late. It, it, I mean, Indiana shot 12 of 17 in the second half against Louisville. I believe that's what the number was. So they've shown Six for improved. seven after Archie went nuts. Exactly. Six for seven. It's a whole new ball game now. Archie yeah. went off on him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So they, they've shown the ability to do it. And you know, at this point, it's a mental block. So if in, Indiana's going to have a very distinct advantage with Juwan Morgan, uh, much like they did with Louisville, and I, I don't know that it's been talked about a whole lot, but there is not one person on Louisville's roster that could guard Juwan Morgan one on one, and there certainly is not um, on Butler's roster. You know, if they have, they they try to put Brunk or Fowler on him, which are they're both six ten or larger, um, he's going to be much quicker. He's just going to be able to out, you know outmaneuver them. If they try to put somebody a little, maybe a little bit smaller on him, he's just they're going to he's going to overpower him. So. They got to play through Juwan. He's, I mean, he should be able to get the free throw line quite a bit, and same with Romeo. So, yeah, I mean, you got to attack the paint uh, on this Butler team and, you know, make them foul you because uh, they don't turn over the ball a whole lot. They average 10 turnovers per game, so you really got to take advantage of your opportunities. So where does Butler have advantages against IU? Like what are the biggest, you know, kind of scariest points for the Hoosiers coming into this one? So uh, the three-point shooting. So they really have uh, a three-headed monster. Uh, Paul Jorgensen, which is their fifth-year senior, their point guard, uh, number five. He actually leads them in scoring at 17.2 points per game. Uh, Baldwin's at 16.6. And then Sean McDermott, uh, I believe he's about 6'6", six, 6'7". Six, six, he's from Anderson, Indiana. He shoots the ball really well when he's, when he's hot. Uh, same with Jorgensen. If they get hot, I mean, you can be in trouble. So... Um, I, w- I was at the Louisville game and just, you know, watching they Indiana didn't close out very well on uh, Jordan Wara, most, if not at all, all game, which is what kind of drove me nuts. A couple of those shots they could have, you know, taken out just could, with very, very short closeouts, which is an easy look. You, you know, if you close out short, you don't even know the defenders there. So you're going to have to close out hard on McDermott, especially because uh, he's not really much of a threat to go off the bounce a whole lot. Jor- Jorgensen can get downhill really quick, him and Baldwin. Uh, both can play downhill real well. So um, you just got to defend the three-point line really well. IU's been doing that you know, pretty good for the most part. So if you can take that away and you don't allow them to get hot, they're going to struggle offensively because they really feed off. If you go back and watch the game they played the other night against Northern Illinois, uh, I mean, they were making everything. So you can't let that happen. And you just got to control the game on the defensive end from the tip. It felt like part of the reason why Nuora was getting a lot of open shots is is when when Juwan was on him. Mm-hmm. And Juwan not necessarily as adept at closing out as some other guys because he's more used to playing inside. You know, when you look at at these two guys for Butler, uh, Jorgensen and McDermott, mm-hmm. you know, they're more guards. So mm-hmm. it, you would seem to think that maybe Romeo takes McDermott and you know, or, or McRoberts and maybe Durham or someone else will take Jorgensen um, with probably Devontae and Rob Finnessy on Kamar Baldwin, you would think. Mm-hmm. So hopefully, maybe since those guys are more guards and you shouldn't have you know a forward like Juwan Morgan matched up against them, maybe that'll make the closeouts a little bit more natural, a little bit better. That At least one hypothesis for maybe how, <laughs> how we can do it a little better than against Louisville, because you're right, they got way too many open looks from three in that game. Yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, Jorgensen's about 6'4", McDermott's about 6'6", so you'll probably see McRoberts or the three play on McDermott. I think if you run him off the three-point line and you can you have your help side, in a good position, you can really, you know, you know, take him out of the ball game. Uh, you know, Jorgensen, yeah, you just have to close out strong and probably Fennessey. I mean, Fennessey's played great defense. If you look at the matchup with uh, 
Dwayne Sutton and I forget the other guard's name from Louisville, but Fennessey Cunningham, had a, I think. Yeah, Cunningham, that's right. He played a really, really good game defensively, and I don't think you could ask much more from him. So, you know, if he, he if he repeats that performance, and then I think IU is going to be in a good spot. This this should be a game that you know if IU just handles himself defensively, this should be a game that they should win by you know six to ten points. <laughs> So we'll, we'll see if we can get yeah, that. Lucky. Should be doesn't yeah. always work out against Butler yeah. in the Crossroads yeah. Classic. I know, uh, I know. It this feels like a Zach McRoberts game to me mm -hmm. because you know he's been struggling a little bit, but it seems like this is a matchup you know against you know two perimeter players like that who can really shoot threes, where you know a guy like Zach, his defense, his awareness. It, it, can really be useful. Not to mention, you know, this Indiana team has been one that has struggled out of the gate sometimes. They're not going to have the home crowd behind them. Maybe Zach off the bench can give you a little bit of lift. And this Butler team isn't overly athletic, so they can't really, you know, take advantage of the weaknesses that Zach possesses. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping my, my early prediction for game ball is that Zach McRoberts off the bench kind of does a few more Zach McRoberts things, gets those tip out, you know, rebounds, plays some solid defense on a guy like McDermott. And we come on the post game show and are all kind of lauding, you know, Zach McRoberts getting back to doing Zach McRoberts things. Cause this feels like that type of game. Yeah. You think um, if he has a game like Colin Hartman did two or three years ago um, against Notre Dame, when it kind of catapulted IU to the big 10 championship, if he, if he can just have a few moments like Colin did that game. Yeah. Yeah. Then we're probably having that conversation. And I think it's going to be a good opportunity because I mean, he doesn't, nobody respects him when I use on offense. And I think he just needs to look at the rim just a few, just a little bit more. Like He doesn't, I, you know, when I'm watching him, he doesn't, look at the rim he, he it's more in the flow of offense and i know he doesn't want to take a quick shot and i understand that's part of the game plan but if he's in the corner and you know somebody's got to close out eight to ten feet let one go man and you know you hit a couple and then that opens up the floor you get juan in the post and then indiana's really rolling what else stands out about this game that we should be looking looking at uh yeah i looked up and down um butler's roster I, they, they play hard they they've lost a couple head scratchers i mean Dayton hasn't isn't really that good. I mean, they're 75th in Ken Palm. You know, they lost that game in Atlantis. So, and they lost at St. Louis. Those are their only two losses. They haven't really. They beat Florida. That was in Atlantis. But I mean, their schedule doesn't scream like. You know, we've we've been challenged. We've been faced with real adversity. Um, Both yeah. games they lost. They shot poorly from three exactly. against uh, St. Louis. They were 17 percent, and against Dayton, they were 30 percent. Yeah. So, and it, it it's just it's just going to come down to the defensive end for IU. If you can hold them <clears throat> under their season averages, you're going to give yourself a very very good chance of winning. You just can't let them get hot. Uh, they have a uh, a guy off the bench, Aaron Thompson. He's another lefty. He he can shoot the ball real well. He plays. He scores about six a game, but he plays. He's playing about 28 minutes a game. So, uh, Laval Jordan goes about eight or ten deep. Uh, one thing I've done some research on, I haven't found yet. Jordan Tucker. Does that name ring a bell to you? Yep. We almost got him. Yeah. Thanks, Duke. Yeah. And then he transferred out. So I'm not sure when he becomes eligible to play, but he is on the bench for Butler. And so obviously that would be a wild card if this game is his first game in. So I would love to see, cause I can't remember when he transferred out from Duke. Um, so I haven't seen anybody say anything yet, but that, that would be kind of a wild card. Cause obviously he, he was a good scorer in high school and, um, but other than that, you, you cut off the, the head of the three McDermott Baldwin and Jorgensen you give yourself a pretty good shot. Joey Brunk is a name that Indiana fans will be familiar with. Um, you know, one of those 6'10", 6'11 guys that you were talking about. He's not starting, um, I don't think, or at least he's not playing the most minutes down low. Fowler is. Mm -hmm. But he's been really effective. He's actually first in the country in two-point field goal percentage, 25 for 30. So, you know, we've seen – you know, because in some of Indiana's lineups where Juwan Morgan is playing center, we've seen a guy like Daniel Gafford. We've seen Derek Pardon, you know, really kind of go off uh, and either get Juwan in foul trouble or take advantage because Juwan can't play that aggressively. So this would also seem like a game where Deron Davis is probably going to need to play mm -hmm. 18 to 22 minutes and going to need to be pretty effective with those minutes because, you know, at all times, it seems like they have one of those 6'10", 6'11 guys out there. And while height is a weakness for them overall, that will give them the tallest player on the floor in our in the lineup that we like to use the most, and we've seen Indiana have troubles with lineups like that. Yeah, uh, Fowler he's a, he's the he has quicker feet than Brunk. Uh, Brunk is more your traditional post guy, so he would be a good matchup for Duran. 
Um, I, he would have a very hard time guarding Jawan, especially if he can get him moving around that inner circle right there around the paint. So, uh, but yeah, Davis is going to have to play huge. And I know, I think you guys talked about it in the post game show again after Louisville's. You know, you get a week off, it, he gets a chance to build more stamina, get himself better conditioned because he's playing well. I mean, he he went to work against Louisville. A lot of those guys had issues with him. So he continues to build that stamina. I mean, him and Brunk should be a good matchup. They're both about the same size. Uh, Duran's probably obviously, you know, heavier, but I, he, he's got good strength. So, um, yeah, that'd be a great matchup. Duran's got to play big minutes. Uh, and in and, and a game like this, I wonder, do, you, do we see Clifton Moore? A little bit. I don't know if that'd be a good or a bad thing, or maybe even Jake Forrester to kind of combat some of um, the size and the quickness of Fowler, depending on what happens with Jawan or if it, you know, Fitzner would be, you know, I totally forgot about Fitzner. He would be a good idea to m maybe match up with Fowler and bring Brunk out. Um, so a lot of, a lot of interesting lineup combinations, but we're gonna have to find that three through five guys to really play off of. Juwan and Romeo. Yeah, well, and Brunk is a guy who draws fouls. I mean, he's drawn 6.7 fouls per 40 minutes. So, you know, you may just see Archie try to match when Brunk is in there, get Duran in the game. And if Duran ends up getting in foul trouble, then yeah, maybe you see Clifton, maybe you see Jake, you know, to just come in and provide a little bit of a presence down low and preserve Juwan because we can't, you can't let him get in foul trouble guarding Joey Brunk. You know, I mean, I right. think you've got to, you got to have those other guys on him. So it'll be interesting. Yep. You know, it's a, uh, you know, there's, there's positives for Indiana, but there's also some strengths that Butler has that Indiana is really going to have to, to pay attention to. And I guess that's why it's a 50% shot for each yeah. team, which should make for a heck of a game. Yeah. Um, you were telling me you, you previewed this on the inside out pod. Where can people listen to your podcast and subscribe to it? Yeah, uh, so I'm on, I'm on nine platforms. Uh, obviously, I'm on Anchor, which is my my main platform. You can find me on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, uh, Spotify, amongst others. Just search um, for Inside Out. Inside Out. Yep, uh, that is. I got a, a link to it on my Twitter, which is at underscore Josh Wilson thirty three. You can actually follow the podcast. It's at Inside underscore Out Pod um, on Twitter. So, yeah, finally getting things rolling over there. So it's fun. Dang it. I have a drop with Archie saying inside out. Oh, there we go. It's called inside out. There we go. I was trying there to find go. that. It would have been perfect. And I Love lost it. it for a second. <laughs> cool, Love man. It. Well, Josh, thanks for being here. And yeah. are you going, are you going to the crossroads? I, I thought about it, but since I got to go to the Louisville game, I'm going to be down for uh, the Jacksonville game on the 22nd. And I, cause I was at the Northwestern game. So I'm trying to space myself out here with the, the season tickets. I don't want to be too greedy. I got to share them with my brother and my, my dad. So, um, yeah. and then big 10 play starts. So I'm pumped, but yeah, I'll be back down for Jacksonville. Um, but I'll be, I'll be at home or here in the man cave, hopefully to watch them get a W against Butler. Very nice. Very nice. It should be a fun afternoon of basketball. Alrighty. So. That is going to do it for us on this week's episode of banner Monday. If you want to see us do the show live and be part of the live chat, join us at assemblycall.com on Monday afternoons for the live broadcast of our banner, banner Monday recording. And you can always subscribe to our podcast by searching for Assembly Call wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't forget to go to assemblycall.com or text IU to 66866 to join our free email newsletter. It's going to make you a smarter and more well-informed IU basketball fan. Thank you for listening. We will talk to you after IU Butler. Until then, keep your elbows in and your eyes on the rim. And go Hoosiers. Thank everybody for coming out. All right. I got to get out of here, folks. Thank you. Mm, Actually, we'll talk to you. We'll talk to you after we're for Assembly Call Radio. I totally forgot about Assembly Call Radio coming before IU Butler. Yeah. Oh well. Chat mobbers, as Megan would say. <laughs> Chat mobbers. Chat mobbers. I got a good one. Is Jen in there? I got a good one of Jen saying. Chat mobbers. Chat there mobbers. You. So we may have to get we may have to get Jen's in there. I haven't worked hers into the rotation yet. Yeah, she's she in there. Here? She's in the she's chat. Yeah, she's in the <laughs> she, chat. What other ones did I get from Jen? There's some good ones. And the chat mob. It was gorgeous. There are a lot of <laughs> IU fans there. The victorious episode. <laughs> I great. didn't remember how athletic he was. Yeah, so I got <laughs> I got some good ones from her that I need to work in. That's great. Uh, cool, man. Well, thanks for being here and uh, uh, good stuff with Ben last night too. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. We we've been trying to get obviously coach's schedule is uh, hectic, but we try to get together. So I'm I'm actually I'm gonna go catch a couple of his games over the next month because I mean him and I only live about oh, a half you? hour. Yeah, him and I only nice. live about a half hour apart. So 
Um, we got. We, we should do a post game show after a Western game. We should. <laughs> just, uh, and just, we should. And just just give the coaching staff hell for all the mistakes that they made. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Uh, they're on a little bit of a losing streak right now, but they've played a very tough schedule. So three A basketball in the state of Indiana is never a uh, never an easy. They got problems. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what he said last night. <laughs> really? Yeah, he ought to be fired. Yeah, we'll, just, we'll use all of his drops against him. Oh man, that'd be great. <laughs> Fans are so critical of athletes. <laughs> Yeah, he plays my wife's alma mater in a couple of weeks. I'm going to make the trip over there and give him hell for it. Does he? Where'd your wife go? <laughs> uh, Twin Lakes and Monticello. Ah, Twin Lakes. Yeah, I, yep. I went to West Lafayette, so we played Twin Lakes all the time. Oh, yeah. Yep. Very nice, man. Well, cool. Well, thanks for being here, and yep. uh, hopefully we'll see you Thursday night or Saturday in the chat mob. I'll be there. Cool. All right, I'm going to go get the podcast posted. Thanks, for everybody, for being here live. It's always fun to see so many people live for the Monday afternoon shows. They are fun to do. Okay, we will talk to you guys Thursday night, AC Radio. See y'all.